All right, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us. We're seriously, uh, we're seriously honored to be asked to do this. Um, I tell a little bit about myself. I've been in the HVAC trade since 82. I see there's some contractors out there, maybe some other UTI guys. Um, if you want to put 82 into perspective, that was before the first cordless drill. So if you see that picture there, that was the first one I had. It was a couple years into the trade before I was able to afford to buy one of those. I've been Nate certified since the 90s, and I continue my Nate certification in heat pumps and heat pump installation. Um, I was BPI certified in 2009, and I've kept up my certification through all of these years. Um, I've been installing mostly just heat pump systems since 2015, previously working for my previous employer. And um, I only wanted to do heat pumps, and I wanted customers to have a place to call that they could speak heat pump and not get talked out of it. So I started this business in uh, late 2019, early 2020. We're a very mission-driven company here at Electrify My Home. Our mission is to provide the most cost-effective, most efficient uh, heat pump solutions to California homeowners. Uh, we practice good, good stewardship of the electrical panel and to train and influence other contractors to do the same. Currently, we are providing a three-day training program through the Tech Clean California program, where we've been traveling throughout the state to get other contractors fired up about being an electrification contractor and understanding there's more to home electrification than just installing a heat pump. We're starting, this is our first of six in our six part webinar series. Uh, hashtag electrify efficiently. If you have any comments about this and you would like to share them on LinkedIn, if you use that hashtag electrify efficiently, that would be great. Um, today is good, electrif good electrification for policy and program professionals. Um, we're coming up with home electrification product overview with special guest Sean uh, from Redwood Energy and uh, quite a few other classes coming up. We would love it if you would join us on those as well. Um, our area of focus is um, residential building electrification retrofit. Uh, we do some remodel and new construction work, but very little. Uh, we install a lot of uh, heat pumps and hybrid water heaters, and as well as the split system heat pump water heaters. Uh, we're going to talk about overcoming home electrification barriers. We'll talk about approaches that optimize comfort, efficiency, resilience, and low operation cost. And I think everybody in this uh, course will benefit, um, especially contractors and industry professionals. But today is just focused on something we love to talk about, which is programs. So we're going to get to the basics. Obviously, we all know now that building electrification is not something that's going to get stopped in its tracks. We're well on our way. This has all been coming for years. Um, some of the first clean air laws in California, as you all know, started in the 60s, and we're really just getting to the, we're getting to kind of the precipice of things, getting to the point where we need to get serious about home electrification. So California passed the first program uh, a few years ago. Governor Newsom called for us to move faster. And uh, recently, um, the California Energy Commission said we need to install 6 million heat pumps before 2030. Uh, that's a lot of heat pumps. We installed 125 of them last year. So uh, we're going to try to double that this year, but that's a long way from 6 million. And then California is also making moves to ban natural gas furnaces by 2030. I believe with some of the clean air regulations in the Central Valley and Southern California, they're kind of banning themselves. 90% of California homes rely on gas for space or water heating. And we would think about the magnitude of that and the number of homes that we have to, to deal with. 11.7 million homes in California use gas or electric resistance and 85% use just gas. So this is an amazing opportunity for us to really make an impact out there by doing this correctly. Uh, 12 million California homes have gas water heaters, 93% of those, and three and a half, uh, 3.4 million homes have no air conditioning at this point. 
And if we think about some of the weather patterns that have been happening over the last few years, like our, our late heat wave that we had in California back in October, early November, it seem, seems like that's when that was, um, we know that uh, across the state, there was a lot of people suffering from heat that didn't have air conditioning. When everybody has an air conditioner in California because they had their furnace replaced with a heat pump, um, we're gonna have whole new challenges on, um, on our energy supply. And that's why we say e electrify efficiently is, is so important. Um, let's go with the basics, start with the basics here. I'm sure a lot of everybody on here understands this, but um, heat pumps are way different. They move heat around and they don't create heat. We know that gas furnaces create heat as a byproduct of combustion, and uh, we kind of harness that combustion to warm our houses up. But there's some there's some inherent safety problems with that. There, uh, you know, if a if an if a company offers a safety check on an appliance, it means that there is some chance of it being unsafe. So one of the beautiful things about heat pumps, we don't have to worry about that that whole safety angle. Uh, for those of us that don't understand exactly how heat pumps work, um, this is a this is a schematic diagram that is showing summer mode. Heat pumps are basically a heat transfer mechanism with an indoor and outdoor section. This particular uh, summer diagram is showing cooling mode. The blower in the house, whatever this might be, a wall-mounted unit, a fully ducted system, whatever it happens to be, operates the same way. The warm ambient air from the indoor part of the house gets pulled through the blower and it gets forced across a evaporator coil. That evaporator coil has very cold refrigerant gas um, flowing through it. That cold refrigerant gas absorbs the heat from the house, as you notice by the low incoming temperature and the higher outgoing temperature, it's carrying the heat from the house away from the system or away from the air handler, gets pulled into the compressor. The compressor is not only the fluid transfer pump, but it also compresses the refrigerant and embeds that heat into the refrigerant gas. It comes out as a really hot vapor at about 150 degrees in this application. It travels through the condenser coil. That condenser coil draws in outside air from the ambient conditions, whatever it happens to be outside, and that causes the, the refrigerant to condense. The refrigerant becomes a liquid as it exits the condenser coil. That liquid then flows through, hits the expansion device. The expansion device is nothing but a very small hole. That high pressure liquid refrigerant hits that small hole, it flashes off, and it creates the same process. This, can, this process continues to uh, function until the thermostat is satisfied, then the heat pump compressor and system turns off. Where the rubber meets the road on heat pumps is the compressor. There's a few different types of these nowadays, um, and there's different efficiencies that are derived through this process. Uh, most heat pumps installed today are still single stage heat pumps, so this compressor runs at one speed. When it completes the cycle, it shuts off. Um, we also have multi-speed compressors that sometimes just have restrictive orifices that slow the fluid down. Some of them actually operate in multiple stages, um, but that might give you a 60 to 100% split in load, and so that makes things a little better. But then we talk about inverter compressors, and there's a couple of different types of inverter compressors as well. We have fully communicating inverter compressors, and then we have um, coil temperature monitoring inverter compressors that actually adjust the compressor speed based on the coil temperature. So that's a new thing to come around in the last few years, pretty interesting technology. The lady in the boat is a metaphor, as things often are. This metaphor indicates with our company, we help you do electrification at your own pace, or we can do it all at once. And this is this is the, the track that a lot of our customers take, is we wanna do one or two things in the house in the right order to get the most impact. And we call that good electrification. Good electrification is basically installing the most efficient solution possible, 
utilizing existing infrastructure when possible and consider all electrification requirements from the start. So typically, uh, one of our projects, we really pride ourselves on not having to upgrade electrical panels to do our electrification projects. That's not possible in every project, but the majority in the high 90%, we are able to put our low energy pre-planned, well-executed systems into houses without upgrading the electrical panels. We like to let the, let the customer get the electrical panel upgraded at the time it's really necessary. And a lot of times that's when the solar and batteries might be installed later when they're doing renewables. We've actually gone to projects this year that um, contractors weren't necessarily being the most, um, they weren't being the best steward of the electrical panel. And we had a couple this year where the electrical panel had to be changed out a second time when they added the battery and solar, even though the contractor came in and recommended a, a, a panel change with their heat pump solution that they had. So we really don't want people to bear the brunt of this cost twice. So we are really looking at when we do our, our, our home um, assessments, we are really looking at how we can stretch that panel within its capacity using what we refer to as the watt diet and um, make sure we're optimizing the, uh, the panels. And uh, we'll go a little bit more into that in a second. But to be a good steward of the electrical panel, a steward is one who directs the affairs in the best way possible. We know what this is. Um, each homeowner's journey is very unique. Every house and every homeowner is going to have a, a unique um, electrification journey. And we wanna plot that out from the first step. So when we start communicating with our prospective clients, we always do it via uh, uh, virtual assessments. So we're talking to that client about their needs, their, their plans going all the way through and helping them figure out the right order to do things, making sure that we can, we can optimize what they have in the house to keep the cost down as much as we can. We try to uh, take all the future loads into consideration and plot out that plan of when and if that panel is going to be replaced. When we're electrifying a house, we have a lot of great choices we can make to help us do this. And, and heat pumps are the biggest one, right? So a lot of, a lot of uh, uh, the, the customers we talk to have talked to other uh, persons that have recommended more traditional heat pump systems that require up to six breaker spaces be added to their, uh, their system. That to us is really not good electrification. We want to optimize the breaker space as much as we can. Uh, we prefer to use um, inverter driven equipment that only needs two breaker spaces for the entire system uh, and designing the system and, and fixing the house to meet those requirements is a big part of what we do. Also the dryer, if they have a gas dryer now, we can't forget that that's gonna need a 30 amp space Hot water is either gonna need 15 or 30, or now we have some great new 115 volt plug-in um, options, which I happen to have one of those in my house for this very reason. I have underground wiring come into my house. I have a 100 amp panel. And in order for me to put my heat pump water heater in, I had to get a 110 volt model um, because it's gonna be very expensive for me to pull new wire through the street. But I now have everything electrified in my home, including solar and a battery, all on a 100 amp panel setup because we did it very carefully. And I did a lot of work on the house first to make a much smaller system work really well. Uh, don't forget the range. And then some houses we have a cooktop and an oven and that can stretch that. Some customers are gonna have a hot tub. We gotta look at that. And then we have to assume that every customer in California is eventually going to have an electric car. And that might be the time that they actually need to expand their panel. Um, but to keep costs down for people moving into these electrification systems that we install, we try to keep the panel investment um, out, of the, out of the quotation in the, in the early parts so that we can get a better project done. As we know, traditional heat pumps, well, traditional heat pumps, I've been at HVAC tech for 40 years. And, and uh, when I was in my early tech years, we worked on a lot of heat pumps. I worked up in Redding, California for a number of years, and there was a lot of heat pumps up there. And when it got really cold, they didn't work that well. In fact, they didn't work really well at all when it got below 40. So the solution back then was to put a big old strip heater on there 
And I happened to work for a company at the time that did a whole housing track and didn't put strip heaters in. So it was a busy couple of weeks when it got really cold. Uh, but the downside to a traditional heat pump is that it works a lot like your furnace works. So this is in a cooling scenario. It's 80 degrees in the house. We turn the heat pump on. It runs at one speed and takes care of this load based on how much energy is needing to be removed from the house. And they never really spend a lot of time around comfort zone. This, this happens to be set at 75 degrees. As we know, if we just have a furnace in our house, it always gets a little warmer than the set point and a little cooler than the set point before it turns on. Heat pumps can do the very same thing, um, just like a traditional air conditioner. When they turn on and off all the time, they have to overshoot the temperature um, in order to not cycle too much. So this is what we talk about as the glide in this particular application. The air conditioner is running, it's 80 degrees, it passes the 75 degree point, it settles in say at 73 and a half and shuts off. This glide right here is going to be dictated by several factors how well your building envelope is designed, how warm it is outside, which way your windows are facing. There's a lot of, lot of things that are, uh, that are gonna factor into that, as well as how many cycles has the system ran and how well tempered is the house. So what we see here is we use a lot of energy to remove this heat and then we let the heat come back into the house and then we use a lot of energy to remove it again. And we spend a lot of time dancing around the comfort zone, but we really don't spend a lot of time at the comfort zone. And our bodies can feel this differential, especially in the heating mode. Um, the off and on nature of these just really limits your comfort. These systems are known to be pretty noisy. We have a lot of, we have a lot of sound ordinances in the Bay Area where we work a lot. So we're looking for a quieter operation. Um, these systems, if it gets below 41 degrees, they're going to lose some traction in the in the winter time, and it may be a point where it's not satisfactorily heating the house. Usually, these type of units are limited to one or two stages, and these systems are going to take up to six breaker spaces. So, not what we call good electrification. It's basically like having a bunch of arbitrary stop signs on the highway. You get your car up to where it's getting good gas mileage, stop sign. Now, we already have this in the Bay Area. It's called traffic. But if we had these out on I-5, it just wouldn't make any sense. It's not an efficient way to do things. So what works so much better is inverter-driven heat pumps and most, uh, most particularly communicating inverter heat pumps. The way that these units work is they, they, they invert the power from the wall to AC and back invert it into three phase. They, it's, it's kind of a hybrid power that can operate above and beyond the 60 Hertz range and below the 60 hertz range. When this unit um, has to get a job done quickly, it can because it has reserve capacity and the compressor can speed up really fast. So this is great on the colder nights of the year or when we, we walk into a warmer house and we wanna get a, a large temperature differential um, satisfied. But you notice the, the slightly wavier lines here, this is what we call the tempering time. So once your house, the air in your house is to temperature, now we have to take all of the heat out of the adjoining articles like your couch and your countertops and your books and whatever the case may be. Um, this is that tempering phase where the unit is making more drastic but still not dramatic adjustments in its capacity to get everything in the room the same temperature. Then once we get over here where the lines are less wavy, this is what we, what we call thermal equilibrium. When the house is really, everything in the house is the same temperature and, and we're really utilizing the house at this point as a, as a thermal storage battery. So once that house is cool, it takes a lot less energy to keep it cool. So not shutting the unit off and letting the house get hot again really, really saves a lot of energy. So in the systems that we typically install, this is a hairdryer level of energy, and this is like multiple old school light bulbs level of energy. In my particular application at my home, I've done a lot of research and, and really watched how my system works. And I know I can cruise my system on an average day around 100 degrees. I can cruise my system once it's reached thermal equilibrium. I can cruise that system for about four and a half hours for the same amount of power as it takes to run it in high speed for one hour. So keeping your house tempered is a lot less expensive way to operate your system, which we want because when we're using a lot less energy, if every house, when we have a, a heat wave, is able to main, maintain and manage its cooling and, and use that thermal 
building envelope as a battery, we can use a lot less energy in the peak load times and still keep our houses very comfortable. What do we see here? A lot of people look at this panel and they think it's completely full or there's no opportunity for, for adding additional circuits. And this is a really good example because this one has a, a lot of arc fault uh, breakers in it that take up a lot of space. Generally, they could double up these breakers and get more breaker space. And down here, you see we've got doubled up breakers. And here we've got a quad breaker that looks, looks like this one is sharing um, two, two HVAC systems. And then we got two double pole 20s here. There is opportunity, uh, 30 and a 20, it maybe looks like. Um, I don't have my glasses on and my computer screen is a full two feet away. So this panel is full when we look at breaker space, but how do we know if it's full when it comes to capacity? Panels have a lot of space in them. A 100 amp panel at 240 volts is 24,000 watts. And we know we don't run our every appliance in the house all at the same time. So when we do a panel load calculation, we can really get in and kind of aggregate what these things are. And what we find is a lot of times, if we add up the total load of this system without uh, figuring in the reductions, uh, we might have 35,000 watts on this panel. But the majority of the of the breaker space above this and loads above um, the minimum amount can be derated at 40%. So a lot of this panel, this is only counting as 40% load. Um, we obviously have to see the panel to be able to, to um, give you the correct. But that's a lot of capacity in these. And if you're lucky enough to have a 200 amp panel, there's nothing you can't do with a 200 amp panel. Go ahead, knock yourself out, get a sauna, get a hot tub, have a pool installed, three, three electric cars, it doesn't matter what you have. You can make it work with a 200 amp panel for sure. We're electrifying houses fully under 100 amps. So what do we do with a full panel? Quad breakers. Circuit splitters, we use a lot of circuit splitters. A circuit splitter is a device that we can install with, that plugs into your existing dryer outlet. It shares a circuit with another load of equal amperage. And we actually run the heat pump water heater off the, off the secondary side of that plug. And the heat pump water heater will run and run and run. And when you go to turn the dryer on, it just turns off the heat pump water heater while the clothes are drying. When the clothes are done drying, the heat pump water heater comes back on. That's a great way to be able to optimize the electrical panel. Um, also, quad breakers are, are, are a good thing if we've sized the panel properly. If you want more information on how to size these panels, there's a great resource. There's a, there's a, a, a fine young gentleman named Tom Cabot that has some really good videos on YouTube regarding the Watt diet. If you really want to dig into that, or you can come to one of our trainings. We get into that pretty well too. Um, our philosophy of installing small, we talk about that a lot and really just means install the right size. It's easy to install small because everything in California, almost every HVAC system being installed today is the wrong size. It's just, it's, it's, it's plain fact. Most of the systems that are in our houses, in fact, if you've ever heard somebody say, my, my, my furnace works really well, it heats my house up in five minutes, that's, not the right size furnace for your house. I'm sorry. Your furnace has to run 20 minute cycles, otherwise it never reaches steady state. And it's not even it's not even operating at the efficiency or the capacity that it's designed for. So install small just means putting in the right size system. Experts all over everywhere, you, can, you cannot go anywhere without hearing this if you're searching around for information that most systems in California are, are dramatically oversized. We're really blessed out here with, with uh, pretty temperate climates, except in the mountains. And um, it doesn't change temperature that much between uh, winter and summer in most of the places in California. And um, you know, we've, we've just been throwing all kinds of capacity at our homes for so long because our envelopes weren't built that well. Our ductwork is not really efficient and, um, and other things like that that we can fix and make houses theoretically smaller. But it requires a load calculation and load calculations are kind of a foreign entity to some. We really need to get our HVAC industry doing load calculations, and then we have better outcomes. Those outcomes will be able to reduce capacity, which will reduce load, which will reduce drag on the system as we electrify more homes. Um, 
It also requires an understanding of how to, lo uh, to lower the load, and it requires more of a house as a system approach. There's several key points to installing small. Oversized systems are always gonna be louder. They're gonna have a higher heat rise. A higher heat rise in the envelope means that the, the air is going to get closer to the ceiling. It warms up the ceiling, it activates your insulation, pulls the heat right out through the attic. So actually heating the house with a lower temperature air and having a really good blanket of insulation in the attic, that offsets some of the, some of the, uh, the capacity changes with heat pumps and furnaces. Furnaces generally short cycle, especially in milder temperatures. And really how comfortable is it when you're sitting on the couch and you have to throw the blanket off because it's getting too warm and you got to put the blanket back on before the thing starts back up because you know it's about time for the furnace to start because it's getting cold in the house again. A properly installed system, that comfortable system is going to be super quiet. It's going to warm your house up and not heat it. It's going to run longer cycles for really good air mixing if we use the right registers, and it should provide uniform temperatures throughout the house. These things are all possible. It is my it is uh, it is my opinion that people don't really understand comfort for what it really can be. And when you start installing systems that are the right size, have the right airflow, they don't make a lot of noise. We use the correct registers. You really start then experiencing comfort and really. The benchmark of comfort is, can I walk down my hallway in the morning with just my underwear on? That doesn't make my family comfortable, but my house is comfortable enough to do it. We do a lot of inverter heat pump systems. This mini split based technology is what we use um, almost uh, uniformly. And we've tried a lot of different options. So a couple of things you can do is uh, on, the, on the left hand side there, you see a multi-zone heat pump system. That's one outdoor unit that runs multiple indoor units of one variety or another. And on the right-hand side, you see that's multiple single zone units. And anybody that has a discerning eye is probably noticing that this is the same house. Um, I'm gonna give credit to A1 Guaranteed Heating and Air. This is where I spent 15 years of my career. And we learned this lesson the hard way. Um, Richard, if you're on this call, uh, thank you for this bit of education. Uh, but we installed a, a three-ton, three-zone system, and it didn't make the house comfortable. In fact, this is what the customer was, was experiencing. Uh, that doesn't look like comfort. These are all sensors throughout the house, and you can see they were getting temperature ranges between 63 and 72 during the cycles, and it was just really all over the place. Customer was not satisfied. We did a lot of diagnostics on here, and then um, they were able to replace it with the three individual systems and get this type of comfort. Now, what you see here is a, um, is, an, is a data logging system that we installed, and all of these are little thermometers throughout the house. These two happen to be in the supply registers. And you can see here, you can really see the tempering phase of the house as the, as the uh, temperature is a little bit more volatile, they're getting a little warmer. That communicating thermostat is gonna send a signal to the, to the unit and it says, hey, we're getting a little warm in here, we need to reduce capacity. That system will actually slow down while providing the same amount of air mixture and air movement in the house. What happens is the temperature of the air just reduces coming out of the vent. And so it matches the, the house as it tempers as we get here to this point of thermal equilibrium. And you can see that the systems automatically adjust to what's required depending on how efficient that particular part of the house was. This system itself, um, half of the house was not that well insulated. The other half was pretty well insulated. So you'll see maintaining this mid 70 degree range here, we were able to do that with air temperature on one half of the house at less than 80 degrees and one half at just slightly over 85 degrees, which if you think about that, if you've ever lived in a house with a furnace and you look at this level of comfort right here, this should just be making you crazy right now. Load calcs are vital. Okay, I, I mentioned that we do training uh, for another entity and, and we have had a lot of contractors in front of us in the last year and we bring up this slide and it's really, um, it, it's, it's really uh, an eye-opening understanding how many contractors don't use load calculations. And this is the one that we, we share with a lot of people. So typical house, two rooms, nine foot by 10 foot next to each other. And then they have two completely different air requirements. 
I noticed in the uh, that we have um, quite a few engineers and contractors on the call. So a lot of you guys might know this, but why do we think that this room needs 50% more air than this room does? Uh, and it's really because Mother Nature is having an influence on two outside walls here. It has nothing to do with the positioning of the house. Um, it's one wall equals outside versus two walls equals outside. And the load calculation picked that up. We need about 50% more air in this room. But this is another surprising thing. With the right size system in this house, the house had good windows and good insulation, but this is a very small amount of air for these rooms. It's just the way it was. We sometimes have rooms this, this size in other homes and they need 100 CFM, but we don't know that unless we do a load calc. So it's extremely important if we want really good comfort to do a load calc. Calculating duct gain. So this is one of the way um, that you can unlock downsizing. And for you contractors out there looking at duct work, it's really important that you look at duct work because it's the duct work in the house that causes the deficiencies most of the time. It causes high static pressure, it causes high thermal losses, and also it's in attics with bad insulation. So this is just a quick uh, run through we're gonna do. If you wanna do this in your own house, if you have attic, or, um, in, excuse me, duct work in your attic space, you can do this um, equation yourself. It, it's a, uh, a BPI standard, Building Performance Institute standard, that through research they found out that the internal surface area of the ductwork is equal to 40% plus or minus of the square footage of the house. And what that means, if you have a thousand square foot house, you're gonna have roughly 400 square feet of internal duct surface area on a system. And so what we do is we take the square footage of our house, we take the 0.4, which is 40% of the square footage times 0.4, and then we multiply that by the temperature difference. And the temperature difference here is um, a conservative temperature in the attic of 125 degrees in the summer. And if we're keeping our house at 75 degrees, we're looking for about 55 degree air through the ductwork. So, and then you take those and then you divide it by the R value of the ductwork. In this case, we're gonna say R3, which is metal with yellow insulation on it. Let's do the math here. Um, that gives us 42,000. Um, we divide that by three, and that gives us 14,000 BTUs of, of uh, capacity being lost to the hot attic in that scenario. So we had a 1,500 square foot house, we have a 125 degree attic, and I know you contractors on this call know it gets a lot hotter than that in the attic. Um, 55 degree air going through the ducts, R3 insulation. So if we're using R6 insulation or R4 insulation, we just change this number and multiply this out. But in this particular example, we're able to gain 1.2 or we're, we're losing 1.2 tons of capacity of the system to the hot attic space. So now let's just look at this. If we add insulation to the attic space and we bury this ductwork, we put new ductwork in so it's nice and tight and clean and, um, and, and it's not leaking a bunch of air everywhere and then we lay it low on the rafters and we bury it with insulation and we get an average of R30 across that same duct, it reduces our thermal loss to 1400 BTUs. That's over one ton of cooling capacity being lost to the attic space. These are the things that we need to look at when we're putting systems together to make sure that we're, we're putting the whole system together in a way that the whole thing is gonna operate well with each other. This is not something that is going to be affected by a SEER rating or something like that. This is how we keep the distribution. Uh, the efficiency is in the distribution and not the SEER rating. We want to keep the ducts as short as possible, use mechanical elbows, put dampers in the ductwork, just do a good job on the ductwork, pull it tight, insulate everything and seal it, um, and have the goal of zero leakage in mind. So why aren't systems efficient? It's distribution, it's not SEER rating. So a brand new system can be installed on one of these duct systems with this poorly insulated or poorly installed ducts, and it doesn't matter what SEER that system is. So we, we tend to give rebates and incentives out based on equipment efficiency, and we don't spend enough time looking at these problems. So ducts leak 30% on old systems. Ducts have conductive losses. Size always matters. Um, trying to plug and play heat pumps can be a big problem as well. If we just take out an existing HVAC system and throw in a same size heat pump, 
that can cause comfort problems within the system. We have velocity issues, low temperatures that it's operating at, blows on the occupants in the house. So what we need to do is we really need to educate our customers on how heat pumps are gonna work and offer them the most efficient solution possible and play the whole thing out, design it right and install it right. So now we come to the program part. And this is what we love about utility programs. Uh, just a little background. Uh, at the company I was at before, we participated in Energy Upgrade California. We participated in, um, uh, there was a commercial maintenance program that we did for a number of years. Um, we did a Western Cooling Control program. We did Bayrin for many years. In fact, we were the top of Bayrin's list for many years. We love utility programs that push the envelope. The obvious, what we love about them is they're, they're good to help customers offset cost. Higher efficiency equipment can come at a premium. Quality always has a price tag. Paying a living wage has a price tag. Providing excellent customer satisfaction has a price tag. So these incentives help offset that so we can provide a better product for our customer uh, with some offset from these programs. It's good for marketing support because HVAC companies spend about 3% of their gross revenue towards marketing. That's why you see these huge companies are able to advertise on television and whatnot because they're, they're using 3% of a very large budget. Um, typical contractors pay about three to $800 a lead. And every lead from one of these programs is, is an opportunity for the contractor to sell a high quality job without spending this lead money. It also goes a long way that, that if we're associated with a utility company, we get on the utility database and that's, that's basically the utility companies vouching for our quality. These programs are most beneficial when listed among the short list of providers. Um, and they're most beneficial when program and contractors are speaking the same language. And unfortunately that's not always the case. And we can harken back to the point before we were able to get um, what we call decarbonization rebates or fuel switching rebates, uh, we used to fight that fight and there was reasons why in the background. Finally, that's been taken care of. For programs with a short list of participating contractors, it allows the contractors to, to compete against others who pull permits, have gone through training and are knowledgeable about building science. So it does take a lot of those guys out that don't want to participate in this program because they want to operate kind of outside the, uh, the legal limits of the law by not getting permits and HERS tests and things like that. And if, customer wa if a customer wants the incentive, the incentive, uh, they must choose somebody who's at least proven they know what they're doing. Okay, this is the fun part. Where are we on time? Okay, we got good. We're good. Perspectives of a small performance business, and this is really what we are. We we do um, the heat pumps, the heat pump water heaters, the split system heat pumps, water heaters, air sealing, uh, energy testing, insulation, and um, and a few other things, electrical upgrades and things like that. But we're we're really still a small company. What we found in these in some of these programs is that the focus tends to be on quantity of jobs pushed through the program and not necessarily the quality of the jobs. We think that public money should incentivize positive outcomes, that realization rates should be shared with contractors. This is an important point. Um, the data is there to see what the real improvements were on these, on these program jobs. That should be shared with the contractors so the contractors kind of know what they're doing. The company I worked at before did really good work, but and and they they still do very good work and we were we were talking about doing a pay for performance program and we didn't know how much opportunity there was there because we really didn't have a way to track our real performance so we know through meter data and things that are available now we can look back on a customer's uh, a, a customer's energy use before they got the system and after they got the system it would be great to share that with the contractors so we know what we're doing and those who deliver the intended outcomes best should be rewarded accordingly. Contractors that are gonna spend the time and do the job the right way and do the multiple measures and do the load calculations, there should be some additional benefit for those contractors for going the extra mile and providing a superior system. 
I'm going to let everybody laugh for a minute or two and just kind of soak this picture up. Now, I don't know the origin of this picture, but the moment I saw this, I thought energy program, right? So um, there was multiple rebates, maybe. This is just in my mind. I don't know this to be fact, but multiple rebates for, for mini split systems in a single dwelling. Um, but as you chuckle and look at this, there's still the there's wasn't a lot of confidence in these uh, five mini split units going in because they still have the old condenser out here, which is quite strange. And if you think about this conceptually, I think if all of these units come on full force at one time, it might blow this house right off the foundation. But here's some cause and effect that we can understand. So duct sealing programs, and this this is this one's close to my heart because my mom lived in a house. And she had a duct sealing program done on her home, probably it had to be about 10 years ago. And they came in and they installed an ECM motor and they did duct sealing. But there was never any effort to make sure that what the static pressure was on the system um, before and after the duct sealing. And her system operated for years before that with no problems. Her bills were reasonable, but that was this was back in you know 2010 rate days. Uh, but literally when they sealed up her ductwork, that ECM motor failed like nine months later. And when we put a new stock motor back in the unit, we tested the static pressure and it was at 1 to 1 1.2 inches of static pressure in that system. So the, it was likely the leakage in the ductwork was the only thing keeping that thing running before. So there is some diagnostics that should be done on these systems before we just harvest up a bunch of units and, and um, and just arbitrarily put measures into them. This is my favorite cause and effect. I'm doing on time. Okay. So what we have here is AHRI certificates on a couple of different types of systems. And I'm not picking on anybody here or, or, or anything. And this happens to be a train system. Train is very good. I sold that product for years. It's, a, it's an outstanding and exemplary product. And the reason I pulled theirs up is because I knew the model numbers by heart. But I was looking for an 18 sear. That's what this is. This is a R410A TTX. This means it's a it's the better of the train models with the really cool like BMW grill on it. And uh, it's an 18 sear unit, 2000 or 24,000 BTUs, two tons in capacity. In order to get this system installed, we have to combine it with the right coil. So this is a 31 series slab coil, two ton coil. Um, and what they were trying to do and what I was trying to do by this example is see a lot of times when systems are sold, they're sold off the SEER number that's on the brochure. So this, this brochure for this unit would have said up to 18 SEER. And I looked for an actual 18 SEER combination on this system. I couldn't really find one, but I only spent about an hour looking. But I did find this combination to get me at least up to 17 SEER and to the minimum efficiency EER number that it would take to get to the rebate that we were looking at. So what we had to do here was we had to combine this. This furnace is a UD upflow D two stage C cabinet, 21 inch, 80,000 BTU. This means um, variable speed fan, four ton size. So in order to get a 24,000 BTU working furnace, or excuse me, air conditioner, working at as close to 18 SEER as we could, really came in at 17, but meet the 12.5 EER, we had to put a furnace in that's almost four times larger than the capacity would really need. We find when we do load calculations, especially in the Bay Area, Central Valley, and all the, the Central Valley is a little bit different, but in a lot of these areas, the air conditioning and the heating capacity come out very close within a few thousand BTUs. So, if we have an air, if we have a load calculation that's calling for a 24,000 BTU system and we're putting an 80,000 BTU furnace in, what do you think that's going to do when we turn on the furnace? This is going to make for a very uncomfortable home. And to get 24,000 BTUs of, of cooling capacity on this, we're using a four-ton blower, which this is 1,600 CFM. This only requires 800 CFM in most cases. But we had to do this combination in order to get this small rebate. Um, this isn't exactly on all, but this is a great example of how we had to do this for years. In order for us to get an ARI rated unit at, at rebate level EER, 
we often have to put way too big a furnace in for the house. So to get a customer a $350 rebate on this, are we doing them any kind of a service when we put a furnace in that's four times, nearly four times larger than what they actually needed? I don't think so. But now let's look at this one over here. This is an 18,000 BTU system, and this is what we would normally install in, the, in, in a house similar to this. Um, an 18,000 BTU inverter system, uh, mini split based. Uh, this one is gonna have a cooling capacity of 18,000. That's the rated cooling capacity. This, this particular unit will actually go up to 23.5. Um, it gives us an EER at 95 degrees of 13.40, beating this EER. 21.4 sear, um, has a high heat level of 21,000 and a low heat of 12.3 and gives us an HSPF of 10.9. So this system, when we are using the, when we're tightening up the building envelope and we are using the, the house as a thermal storage battery, this is a great system for this because what the system could do, it, it has this built-in capacity for the days it needs it, the warmest day and the coldest day of the year. But all those other mild days of the year where we just wanna be comfortable, this unit doesn't have to use four tons of air to blow out 24,000 BTUs of cooling. So this house with this combination is not going to deliver comfort. This house is going to deliver extreme comfort and we can interchange this. We could put this system in this application with no problem, get much more efficiency out of it and the customers are gonna be way more comfortable. And the, the benefit on this, this equipment is about two thirds of the price of this equipment. So the customer can also has the opportunity to save on the investment cost with this system over the actual equipment cost. So what we usually do is we take that savings from the equipment cost and we put it into building envelope improvements. Smart thermostat incentives are super helpful when we're using um, single or multi-staged equipment. If we have a one or two stage furnace, one or two stage air conditioner, or now we can use them on what we call the uh, the coil temperature inverters. And a coil temperature inverter is a little bit different than a communicating inverter system. The communicating inverter systems need their own communicating thermostat to work best. They all of them have some sort of an interface module that can go on there that we can use a regular 24 volt thermostat, but that decreases the, the capability of the unit to fully modulate. And for us to use the unit as the the uh, thermal the house is a thermal battery approach, we need that full modulation. So um, it really is the the smart thermostats on those are smart because they communicate with the system, but they don't meet the smart thermostat criteria of being able to download data. Um, so manufacturer controllers are necessary for optimization on those. And um, setbacks. This is another thing that we need to talk about with our customers. When we install a heat pump in a house and just a, a traditional heat pump in replacement of a traditional HVAC systems, in the winter time, the customers need to manage their expectations with setbacks very carefully. Because if they let the house get very cold, if they turn the unit off at night and they turn it on the next morning and it's below freezing outside, that unit is going to struggle to heat that house up the next day. And that's often when you'll hear, um, like adding a adding a furnace with it and using a furnace as backup heat with a heat pump. I mean, that's a solution. It seems like a kind of a crazy solution when we're trying to electrify and decarbonize. But the other thing that happens is there's electric strip heaters that are involved. So when that heat pump can't keep up on that cold morning because there, there was too much setback, it's oftentimes those very expensive strip heaters have to come into play. And that really uses a lot of energy because our coefficient of performance on a strip heater is one, the coefficient of performance on a lot of these traditional heat pumps is 2.5 to three, and the really good inverter heat pumps can be up to four. We've also seen this, which is really interesting to us because we're trying to size everything properly and everything we find out there is always too big. So we see these dollars per ton incentives and that really, um, I, I'm not, I, it's hard for me to wrap my head around it with my business model, why this would even exist, but it really discourages downsizing. So if a contractor did come in and do a load calc and um, he he's competing against another company that didn't come in and do a load calc and he comes in and recommends, well, you know what? We can put a little insulation in the attic. We can take care of your ductwork and we can downsize the system to a two ton. And the other guy's saying, no, we want to do a four ton because we can get more rebate money. That, that could shift the 
the position of the customer to where they might go for that more rebate money because they think for some reason that's a good deal. So we had a guy, a customer up in Davis, and he was a, a, a nice guy, and he's very in tune to the energy stuff. And uh, we looked at his house, and um, he had system system in that was kind of big. It was brand new. It was installed by a local contractor up there. And I says, is there a reason why you have such a large system in your house? And he says, yeah, they sized the system uh, for, to the old one, but he told me I could get the new one for just X amount of dollars. I could go up to the next size. And I says, so you paid more money to go with a larger size unit when the old one was fine. I said, that's a lot like going to men's warehouse and having your custom tailored suit and you get up to the counter and they sell the, they'll sell you a 44 instead of the 36 for only $10 more. You wouldn't do that. Opportunities for program improvement from our perspective. Where are we on time? I'm good. Okay. Right sizing as vetted with proper load calculations is better in every way. If we have an opportunity to incentivize right sizing, we will do good by the consumer as the rate payer and also the grid, right? We're, we have a worry about the grid. When everybody in Air California that ha doesn't have an air conditioner now gets one, that's gonna put an amazing load on the grid. When everybody that's now heating with gas is going to be heating with electricity, that's gonna put a load on the grid. If we're heating with inefficient electricity with backup strip heat and these sort of things, that's gonna even be a bigger load. So customers that are co companies that wanna go out and do load calculations and take the time to do these things right should be incentivized on a higher level. And that customer should re receive some additional incentive for um, investing in that extra cost because it does add an extra cost to do all this. You're also gonna get better comfort for the house, right? That's, that's a value for the consumer. And um, proper downsizing adds other benefits. Like the smaller systems take up less space, they cost less. Um, they really work good with envelope measures, but you've gotta do a load calc on these. We should have better incentive for inverter systems, both types of inverter systems, both coil temperature inverters and fully communicating inverters should not be frowned upon in programs. We shouldn't have a program that requires, uh, that opts you out and denies you the program eligibility if you can't get a superheat. Because you know what, these, these small inverter systems, these ducted mini splits especially, there's no provision to take standard refrigerant charge measurements. It's all done, internally to the system. So we can't get a superheat and subcooling. The way we install these is we weigh the charge in carefully based on the line length, and then we monitor a couple of temperatures, and then that tells us that the system is operating properly. And these systems have a way to speed up and slow down a little bit to compensate for minor differences in charge, but they're gonna operate more efficiently as a whole. They're also gonna be much quieter they're they're a bit more forgiving on size because they ramp up. A beautiful thing about a fully communicating inverter is we can put one in a customer's house that hasn't got the new windows yet, is waiting to get the walls insulated later, and we can put a system in that will reach that load at top capacity. And as they do these improvements in their home, as they insulate the walls, they get the knob and tube wiring removed and they insulate the attic they put new windows in, that unit is going to automatically adjust itself for the new normal. That is something we won't get out of a, out of a single stage or just a multi-stage product that's, that's you know, sized using these. So, and they're also way more efficient. If the unit is, is, if it has operational capacity numbers and ratings, those numbers are based on the, the what's called a rated cooling capacity and the rated heating capacity. So anytime that unit is operating at a level below that, it is operating at a higher efficiency than that. We know that the, the system ratings are always measured at that rated measure. So if we can get a system in that's sized right, use our house as a thermal battery, all that time that it's just adding that small amount of temperature to keep the house at comfort, that is the, the, the efficiencies are off the charts on these systems at that point. Installing two systems in place of one system is often a good idea, especially when we're taking out a big giant furnace with a lot of waste capacity in a two-story house and we're putting in a heat pump. A lot of the systems we pull out are 100,000 BTUs and a lot of the heat pumps we install are 36,000 BTUs. There's a big difference in the way that system is going to operate. 
So we have to make provisions and we recommend putting a separate unit upstairs and downstairs so we can take care of the the uh, the internal microclimate zones and everything can be super efficient. And then two smaller systems are gonna operate at a higher efficiency. And you know, you can run just the upstairs heat cooling and not the downstairs cooling and, and the opposite in the opposite season. And we don't have to fire up that big giant unit and shut airflow off to half of it. The multi-zone systems can be beneficial, but they but you need to be careful with these and do a load calculation and duct sizing properly. Which is something we should be doing as HVAC contractors. It, it was always a big part of what they did in the old days. We've just gotten away from it. Performance programs. This is the opinion of, of a few contractors that we've spoke with. Before we did the slideshow, I called up a number of my friends in the business. Uh, and and a lot of contractors are afraid of paper performance programs because they don't understand the true performance of the systems they're installing. And there's always those customers that didn't use their unit for a year because it, it either didn't work or it cost too much to operate and they never used it. And then they put a new system in and they use it all the time. Um, and we're afraid that that's going to show up as a negative performance factor. And a lot of the systems we install are putting heat pumps in where there's gas only. So that's obviously, uh, there's no more efficient air conditioner than not having one. So when we add one to that, it's not going to it's not going to give us an energy savings. Um, so, but that's a perceived barrier with a lot of the contractors out there. We think that we have data, um, and we know that there's meter data and there's permit data and there's ways to aggregate this. If it would be possible to get information on a contractor when you're presenting this to them get a number of their customers addresses look at the meter data over a period of time that was installed and present to that contractor hey you are saving a lot of money on these systems that you're putting in this would be the amount of rebate that you could get off of this because other than that it's really a mystery to the contractors and and we're so busy sometimes these things are not going to generate enough funds to operate to, to offset the admin costs in the office and so there's a big mystery and a question mark going into these if we can answer that by saying look you guys are really installing really efficient systems you should take pride in or you should take pride in that but you, you should also take up this program because you could make x amount of dollars through this program just doing what you're already doing just a thought so also, after the after contractors are participating with, participating with a program, this data is now available. Like even some of the local programs that are here now, we should aggregate some of this data and visit the contractors and go, look, you guys are saving a lot of energy. High fives and kudos to you. Keep doing what you're doing. And then the contractors are participating in the program but might not be doing so well. Look, these are the things that you could do to kind of improve this. This is where you are. Because realistically, when we put these things in the program, we don't know what they're going to do. We put a lot of monitoring systems on our system, so we know what a, a number of them are doing. But the monitoring systems we install take up space in the breaker box, and and they're not you can't install them on every job. But um, if you can tell a contractor how much money they will actually make through the program, you'll be able to sell these programs. So ideas are cheap, and ideas are easy. Ideas are common. Everybody has them. Ideas are highly highly overvalued, execution is all that matters. As HV contract, HVAC contractors, we need to execute better. As, as, as program people, we need to look at these projects and, and design them so contractors can execute better. Because given the opportunity, the contractor will do the right thing, but we need to know what it is. The, the guys out there need to know what it is and there needs to be an easy path to follow. And, and the biggest thing is make these programs easy admin costs in an office sometimes we have to hire another admin person just to administrate a program and then and then with overhead hourly rate um all the costs that go into having another employee we have to be able to offset that cost with with the incentive program it, it needs to make sense for us so the easier you can make those the easier they are to navigate and understand and the more contact there is from the utility program to the contractor i think is going to go a long way for these to have better outcomes so i think we're on time so i guess we can have some questions here if there are any i hope i didn't uh, say anything that